Uh, thank you so much for inviting me. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, this is joint work with uh, three people that are in MIS, and we're all from Purdue University. Okay. Now, when choosing among products, um, we often turn to experts, right? Uh, expert movie critic, uh, expert food critic. Now, one of the things that's currently going on is that increasingly, when choosing among products, consumers are actually relying on each other. Right? So now when you're a consumer, oops, uh, and you're thinking about watching a movie, you can hear both what the experts have to say and what your peers have to say. And research in this area indicates that more and more consumers are actually relying on each other and less and less on experts. Okay. And you see this anywhere for real consumer go goods, uh, when people are seeking advice, even when people are seeking knowledge. Right? So for instance, what's this? Well, that's Britannica. It's an encyclopedia edited by a team of experts. Okay? And they disseminate encyclopedic knowledge to the population. Okay? Well, what's this? Well, that's Wikipedia, an encyclopedia that anyone can edit, where the population is not just consuming knowledge, but also generating knowledge at the same time. Okay? And just like for that screenshot I showed you, you could either listen to what 265 experts have to say versus more than one million of a fellow peers. I mean, Wikipedia can draw from a much, much bigger team of amateur editors. So it's no surprise that it can cover a much wider range of topics, have faster updates. What about quality? Well, it seems like they're even able to produce articles of similar quality, I right, guess the study by nature seems to suggest. Okay? So more and more people are turning to Wikipedia. Okay? And what we kind of want to ask in this study is whether something similar might also happen the way financial information, financial knowledge is generated and disseminated. Okay? So for instance, who's this? Well, that's a woman called Jamie. She's a sell side analyst working for Goldman. Right? So she's disseminating her expert knowledge on certain companies to the investor population. Okay? Well, who's this? Well, that's a guy called Matthew. Well, he's part of the investor population. Okay? And he's consuming knowledge, but also at the same time sharing his view about other companies through social media outlets to other fellow investors. Okay? Again, so the question is, can these social media websites specializing investments that are popping up all over the place perhaps replicate the success of other bottom-up knowledge generators such as Wikipedia? Okay. And ex ante, it's not clear that they would. Right? It's one thing to write an article about the history of Queen's University and load it up on Wikipedia. It's something very different to organize a complex organization uncover value relevant information that's not already factored into the price. Right? I mean, also, these outlets are inherently open. Right? So that's a key strength of these bottom-up knowledge generators. But at the same time, it also makes them very vulnerable to attacks. Right? You could imagine a scenario where I'm an investor, I take a short position, I write a very negative article about co companies, fill it with erroneous information, hope that I fool my fellow investors, the stock price goes down, at which point I cover my short, right? I mean, so investors being aware that something like this might be going on might completely disregard any information that's posted on these outlets, okay? So whether actually investors turn to these outlets for genuine, useful advice, whether these outlets can actually impart value relevant information, it's far from obvious, okay? But if they did, I mean, that would be a game changer, as alluded to by the popular press, even regulators referring to social media as potentially landscape shifting, because it would completely alter the way that financial knowledge, views, opinions are generated and disseminated. Okay. That's the purpose of this study. So what do we do? Well, we look at the biggest social media outlet specializing investments out there. It's called Seeking Alpha. Currently, they have more than 5 million monthly investors. And so what you can do is you can just really pick any company that you're interested in, write about it, and load it up. Right, so let me give you a screenshot. It's the same guy, same article. So he decided to write something about RIM. And this is really just the first 20% of this article. The articles posted up there, they tend to be rather long. Okay? And at the end, people can comment on it. And oftentimes, the author would respond to that. And you would have a dialogue. 
kind of like I'm presenting my research today. I know that your comments and thoughts will be very helpful in making my work better, so I'm really excited to be here. Right? You can see something similar motivating an investor to post his view about RIM on these outlets, right? because maybe he'll learn something. Okay? There's other reasons you might want to post there. Um, oftentimes, you'll see at the end of the article, um, a lot of these guys have their own subscriber-based websites. So they say something like, hey, if you like this article, why don't you go to my website, pay $10 a month, and you get more of that. Okay? Um, also, if you give Seeking Alpha the exclusive rights, you now get paced uh, based on the number of views that your article receives. Okay, so, okay, so all these might be reasons you could just share your views about certain companies, but also just because it might be fun. Okay? So we, we download all these articles. To capture the tone on these articles, we conduct textual analysis. Okay? It's become very popular in finance. And what we do is we just count the fraction of negative words in these articles. Okay? As, a, as a proxy for the tone of these articles. Okay? And then we correlate that with the returns on those companies. Right, so here this guy writes about RIM May 7th. Okay? So we compute the fraction of negative words in that article and see what the returns of RIM was May 7th, May 8th, May 9th, and going forward. Okay? And if people really paid attention to that, well, we should see some sort of correlation. Okay? And we do. Right, so the fraction of negative words in these articles strongly correlates with contemporaneous and subsequent returns. Now, there's an alternative interpretation, which is that, well, maybe something really bad happened to a company and it affected stock prices. Okay? At the same time, you have seeking alpha reporting on that news and you have a spurious correlation. Okay? Now, I do think some of that might be going on I don't think it can explain all of the correlation, and here's why. Okay. When you submit an article to Seeking Alpha, it gets first sent to an editorial team. Okay. Kind of like when you post a paper on SSRN, it takes a few days for it to actually get published. You have something similar going on for Seeking Alpha, and they do that to ensure a certain level of quality. The acceptance rate right now is about 25%. Okay. So the correlation we observe here is not between article composition submission and stock returns, but eventual article publication and returns. So there's a multiple day delay. Okay. At the same time, uh, in addition, we also see that this correlation holds for companies that are mentioned in Seeking Alpha, but not in the Dow Jones News Service in the week surrounding the publication of this article on the Seeking Alpha website. Okay. We also find that this correlation is stronger for articles that receive more attention Okay. and for companies that are likely to be neglected by traditional advice sources, like the smaller companies. Right, so together, that kind of makes me believe that at least some of the correlation we detect might actually be causal from articles to stock returns, maybe. Right, that's pretty much the entire paper. It's a very straightforward paper. Um, I'll continue showing you some, some tables now. Okay. So, <laughs> this one. <laughs> so, uh, so <laughs> we download all articles appearing on Seeking Alpha between 2006 and 2010. Okay. Each article is tagged with a ticker, which makes it very easy for us to actually relate it to the CRISP database. Okay. Now, we only focus on single ticker articles. I, the, the, the problem is, which comprise about a third of all Seeking Alpha articles, the problem is if there are multiple tickers, right? so let's say there's two tickers and the overall article is bearish, it's really hard to tell whether the author is bearish on both companies or maybe he's just bearish on one company and he's using the other company as a counterexample. It's tough, right? So to avoid all of that, we just simply focus on single ticker articles. Um, and we do think that this might bias the results, but if anything, it would probably go against us. And here's the reason why we think so. I mean, you saw on the screenshot that people can actually comment on your article, which you could take as a proxy for how much attention that article receives. Right? If there's an article receives zero comments, well, perhaps nobody read it. Right? If there's an article receiving hundreds of hundreds of comments, well, clearly it generated some attention. Okay? 
Now we find that multiple ticker articles on average receive about twice as many comments as single ticker articles. Right? So if you take the number of comments as a proxy for attention, I mean we're focusing more on articles that relatively speaking receive less attention and as such maybe have less potential to affect stock prices. Right? So maybe it biases it against us. Okay. So you've seen this. Okay. Here's some interesting summary statistics. Okay. So the average seeking alpha article has 490 words. Okay. Much, much longer than some of the stuff you see posted on uh, Yahoo Finance and that have been the subject of earlier studies, like 10 years ago. Those tend to be between 20 and 50 words. Seeking alpha articles are much longer. And you've seen a screenshot. I'm not suggesting that what Matthew posted there about RIM actually is true. But when you read the articles, they, they make sense. right? You can actually follow their thought process, not just some blurb. Okay. Um, the average fraction of negative words is about 1.5%. Just to put things in perspective, um, we also downloaded all articles appearing through the Dow Jones News Service. There, the average article length is about 300 words, and the fraction of negative words is roughly similar. Okay. So to gen generate our main results, this is what we do. Okay. So imagine it's May 1st, 2011, okay. and we look at all single ticker articles appearing on Seeking Alpha on that day. Right, so let's say there was one article appearing on Google, we compute the fraction of negative words, 0.21%. Let's say there were also three articles on Apple, we compute the fraction of negative words across these three articles, and let's say it's 0.45%. And we do the same thing with IBM, Duke, Boeing, and Delta. Okay? Then we rank them based on the fraction of negative words. Okay? And then we examine, well, what's the return of Google on Apple versus Boeing, Delta, May 1st, May 2nd, May 3rd, and so forth. Right, so pretty straightforward. Okay. And so here's what we find. Okay. On the day these articles are published, there's a strong difference in returns right, between companies with positive, relatively positive articles on Seeking Alpha and companies with relatively negative articles on Seeking Alpha. That's a spread of close to a percent. It grows. Okay. Um, there's not much of a reversal. If anything, there's a slight continuation. Okay, so it's a super strong correlation between tone and seeking alpha articles and returns. Now you'll notice that most of the action occurs on the day the article is published and the ensuing day. Okay? And that might make some of you a little uncomfortable. It, it kind of makes me a little bit uncomfortable, but Here's one thing to consider. Okay. Again, take the number of comments that an article receives as a proxy for attention that the article receives. Okay. It turns out 60% of the comments an article receives actually occur on T0, the remaining 20% on T1, okay. and the last 20% are just kind of spread out. And casual observation suggests that the remaining 20%, I mean, they just start drifting off, starting about talking complete, some, something completely different. right? So really, if you take the number of comments as a proxy for attention, okay, and you also need to consider that every day you have about 110, 120 articles appearing on Seeking Alpha, okay, every day. And it seems to suggest that the attention an article receives is rather immediate and ebbs quickly. Like most of the comments actually happen here on T0. You post an article, boom, you get a lot of comments. You get a few more comments on T1, and that's about it. Right? So the fact that most of our results actually come on T0 and T1, I mean, it's plausible that that could still be coming, at least part of it, be coming from seeking alpha articles to stock returns. We're trying to do a little bit is to see whether there's a hint of causality here, right? a hint of causality from seeking alpha articles to returns. Okay? And the way we try to do that is we were thinking, well, of course, there's still the possibility that something really terrible happened to that company. Returns go down, and they go down for multiple days. Okay? So even if the article is published with a delay, you still see a spurious correlation. We kind of gather that we look at companies that are where there is an article seeking alpha, but no articles in Dow Jones News, news Service plus minus seven days. Right? Our thinking was that 
if something really that tragic had happened to that company, I mean, it should have also reported by the Dow Jones News Service. Okay? We have a lot more Dow Jones News Service articles than Seeking Alpha articles overall. Okay? And the association still holds. Okay? It's also stronger for articles that receive more comments. Okay? And it's also stronger for articles that are written by, quote, more prolific authors. Authors that have previously already written a lot of articles and have a large following. Okay, so then that kind of makes you wonder, well, maybe there's something going on from seeking alpha articles to stock returns. Why else would this correlation be so much stronger for articles that likely receive more attention? We also find that this correlation is stronger for companies with um, high retail holdings. Right? These are companies that tend to be ignored by traditional advice sources like sell-side analysts. Right? They have less incentives to cover those types of companies. Okay. And you could imagine that also those are the companies where Seeking Alpha has more potential to uncover something new. Actually, just to give you the type of information that these guys sometimes uncover, there was a manufacturing company that supposedly had a plant in China. Okay. So one of these guys actually traveled there with his iPhone, took a picture, said there's nothing here. Right? And then wrote an article about it and the stock price went down. I mean, you can't have traditional advice sources, professional analysts do that sort of thing. And you can see where a little bit where the competitive advantage of these social media outlets comes in. Okay. Now, if you believe the result, well, yeah, the results are there. It's an empirical fact. Okay. Uh, if you believe my interpretation, okay, well, you still have to wonder about the following. Yeah, so maybe investors are paying attention to these Seeking Alpha articles. Okay? The question is, is it because these articles impart value-relevant value information? Okay? Or is it because they just incite naive investor reaction? Okay? We don't know that yet. There's a lack of reversal which seems to point to the former. Okay? But we wanted to test that a little further. Okay? So here's what we do. We look at earnings announcement and the associated earnings surprises. Right? That's just actual earnings minus the consensus forecast by analysts. Okay. Right, so let's say Apple announced earnings uh, November 10th. Okay. We then look at all Seeking Alpha articles written about Apple over the previous month. Okay. We compute the fraction of negative words across those articles and we test whether these articles actually help predict the subsequent earnings surprise. If all these articles were complete noise, okay, or if all the information contained in these articles were something that the sell side analysts already knew, right, and they adjusted their earnings forecast accordingly, we shouldn't see a correlation between the tone of these articles and the subsequent earnings surprise. Okay? There's a super strong correlation. Right? It's very strong. So what this means is you can use the tone in these Seeking Alpha articles to predict subsequent earnings forecasts. Right? There seems to be something there that's A, value relevant, okay? and that is not fully factored in by professional sales side analysts when making their earnings forecasts. Okay? Mm, we have a little bit of exploratory analysis because we were kind of wondering for which kind of companies could this predictability be the strongest. Okay? Our notion was that if these are companies that these guys maybe can easier relate to, like companies with tangible products, like had high advertising expenditure, right? maybe these are companies that consumers have a better feel for than these professional sell side analysts. And we find some uh, evidence consistent with that. Right? You see that this correlation is stronger for companies that bloggers potentially could better relate to. So you, mm -hmm. yeah, could one have traded on it? Now, <laughs> uh, this was pure coincidence, but based on our previous discussions, I'm glad I'm focusing on the long leg here. <laughs> <laughs> so, I, yes, one could truly have traded on it. Could, would one have made money on it? Well, let's see. Right, so we focus on stocks with a price greater than $5, with a market cap greater than $2 billion. I presented this at a uh, hedge funds, and they told me I should focus on that subset because that's to them that's the most interesting. It's the highly liquid. Okay, so on a Thursday, for instance, we look at all articles that appear on Seeking Alpha on that day. Okay, we buy um, at the closing ask. Okay, like stocks that are in the bottom tercel, the ones with relatively low fraction of negative words, the ones that are relatively speaking more bullish on. Okay, 
we buy them at the closing ask and we sell it the next day at the closing bid. Okay, so we factor in the bid ask spread. We do not factor in commissions and price impact. It's, it's a little hard to do. Okay. So one dollar invested in this trading strategy okay, in 2006 would have grown close to two dollars by the end of 2010. Just to put things in perspective, one dollar invested in the Dow Jones would have grown to one dollar and six cents. Right, so this is, economically speaking also, this seems to be rather big. Right? And you can see that the short leg uh, would have done, I mean, it would have gone the opposite. Okay. So you take all of this together. Okay. I mean, ultimately we want to see whether the wisdom of the crowd effect that has been documented in a lot of other areas in marketing and MIS, Okay. Whether we could find something similar also in finance and the way financial views, opinions are generated and disseminated. Okay. So we study the biggest social media outlets specializing in investments. Okay. We look at the articles, capture the tone of those articles, and we find that they strongly relate to contemporaneous and subsequent returns. And this correlation is stronger for articles that likely receive more attention and for companies that are likely to be more ignored by traditional advice sources. Uh, and so one interpretation, there may be others, one interpretation for, you could take away from this is that, yeah, increasingly investors are paying attention to these outlets. They are trading on it, and as such, they have market impact. Okay, and if they did, that would be a big deal, I think. <laughs>